können. Yeah, just lift your hands and just thank God for His tender mercy, His grace. Hallelujah.
mercy, he is always, always providing for us. In spite of it all, in spite of who we are, in spite of what happens around us, God is always faithful, always faithful. Even in moments where it looks like he is not there, he is there. Those moments when it feels like you're by yourself, you are never alone. God is always with us. Let's give him grace, let's give him mercy, let's praise his name. that are showered upon me every day. How he is always the path and it's lighted because of him. We are supposed to be following in his will and he is always with us even when we step in the wrong direction. God is so good. Wasn't expecting to get messed up like that. <laughs> so, good morning. <laughs> good morning and happy Sunday. It is definitely a blessing to start our week in the house of the Lord, to be in his temple, to breathe in his Holy Spirit, to worship and praise his name, to be in his house and to know his word is not a freedom that many on this earth get to experience. So we need to be joyful that we have the chance and opportunity every day to praise him in the open with hearts of gladness. We have a freedom to worship him through technology too. And for those of you who are tuning in to worship with us online, we are grateful for you and the fact that you chose this morning to be with us because you had many options, but you chose to be here. We pray that you will be blessed through this service and perhaps one day soon we'll get to meet one another. My name is Shante Washington and I have the pleasure of being your worship leader this morning. And this week, I just attended two funerals in two days where two friends lost their husbands. One was only 53, the other was 71 and just turned 71 two days ago, or two days before he passed away. The simple fact that God gives us the moment to have breath. Pastor Walton at Brian's funeral said, we don't have tomorrow promise to us. Here today, gone today. You don't know what the next minute you have is going to get you till tomorrow. So we need to be faithful to our God who gives us breath every single day and be grateful for those who have gone before us that have already seen his glory. We need to be in his light. So we are in this new year, but every day we have an opportunity to be in a new creation of Christ Jesus. God promises of his grace fall fresh upon us daily. Ephesians 1, 3 through 6 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless in him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purposes of his will, to praise of his glorious grace, with which we have been blessed, it has blessed us in the beloved. The scripture shows how God loved us before creation, was creation, and chose us before the earth was formed. We can all come before our God through our Savior Jesus the Christ, and we can give grace and love to one another because he himself through the Holy Spirit gives that to us daily. Glory be to the King. I ask that you guys would look to the Lord with me. Heavenly and sovereign God, we look to you to offer your praises and worship. We lift your name upon high and thank you for the glory and peace you give.
forgive us. We are so grateful, God, for the miracle of life today. We thank you that you saw it in your will to wake us up this morning, and we pray that we will honor this day by being in the direct path and acknowledgement of your will. Lord, we welcome you into this house, and we offer this service to you as incense and with prayers. Lord, we ask that you take control of this service and have your way in each of our hearts. We ask that you touch us and draw us closer to you. Let your word penetrate our hearts, minds, and souls and guide us into a deeper relationship with you. Lord, we ask that you would be with your manservant of the hour and let his words be a direct conversation with you and open our hearts so that we can hear from you. We ask that you touch and bless each person that is in the, sound, the sound of my voice. It is in the precious name of Jesus I pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. If you, yeah, y'all settle. If you are visiting Heritage for the first time, we ask that you would stand, or if you're online, that you would give a little message in the chat. Um, and we're very grateful that you're here to welcome us. So if you're new here, please stand up. While you're standing, our ushers will be giving you a little contact card just so we can get to know one another and get a little bit more familiar. And Heritage, we ask that you just look around, give a wave, give an air hug, give a fist bump. If you're close, maybe you want to give a hug, I don't know. <laughs> Whatever social distancing practices you're good with as a way of welcome and love. that you would now turn your attention to our screen for our video announcement. Good morning, Heritage family and friends. Here are your announcements for today, January 15th, day two of our weekend of service as we honor Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was a champion of the poor and the marginalized. In his honor, the Heritage Fellowship Church Community Outreach Ministry is coordinating a series of activities for a weekend of service from Saturday, January 14th through Monday, January 16th. Yesterday, Heritage began this weekend of service at the Hypothermia Shelter, providing hot meals, desserts, and beverages. Today, Sunday, January 15th, we'll again provide hot meals at the Hypothermia Shelter. Tomorrow, as we honor the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., we'll be serving a special holiday dinner to the residents of the Embry-Rucker Shelter. Will you be a resource for someone in need during this MLK weekend? Prayerfully consider how you, your family, and your friends might make a difference this weekend. The meeting, originally scheduled for Saturday, January 7th, has been rescheduled to Saturday, January 21st, 2023 at 11 o'clock a.m. following our monthly Heritage Helps food distribution. The date change agreed upon by the diaconate and board of directors leadership is to address accessibility concerns of our members. We appreciate your patience as we make efforts to include all members who wish to participate in this important meeting. Miss this message in your email? Check your spam and promotions folder. If you need assistance, contact realmhelp at heritageresting.org. That's R-E-A-L-M, help at heritageresting.org. The 2023 Spring Session of the Bible Institute starts Monday, January 30th. Registration opens tomorrow. During this session, classes are offered on Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday of each week. They'll be offered in both online and in-person formats. Details and registration information will be posted on the website or send an email to bibleinstitute at heritagereston.org. We are excited to announce 
than a pilot for in-classroom study at 10.45 a.m. for Sunday school, pre-K to fifth grade, Generation Praise, fifth to eighth grade, and Teen Church, ninth to twelfth grade, starts February 5th, 2023. However, we need volunteers to help us be successful. We are searching for teachers, assistant teachers, registration team members, security personnel, arts and craft teachers, biblical researchers, AV support team members. In-person training will be provided on Monday, January 23rd from 6.30 p.m. until 8.30 p.m. If you are interested in serving in any of these roles or want to learn more, send an email to sundayschool at heritagereston.org or stop by the information kiosk and speak with Shamika Ward. After the funeral, when the cards and flowers have stopped coming and most of the people around you return to their normal lives, your grief continues and you feel alone. Grief Share is a virtual support group that meets weekly January 23rd through April 24th at 7 p.m. You'll find it to be a warm, caring environment and come to see your group as an oasis on your long journey through grief. Contact Deacon Peggy Tatum for more details. This week, we are praying for several members who are seeking prayer for encouragement, healing, or God's intervention. Please add them to your prayer list. Jeffrey Austin, Gretel Centeno, Dallas Gravett, Winston Hemingway, Father of Thaddeus Hemingway, the Copacan family, Carolyn Rottenberg, and Ronald Wiley. Also, please keep the following in your prayers this week. Heritage Leadership and Congregation, The Church Universal, All College Students, COVID-19 Survivors. And please keep Heritage families experiencing loss in your prayers. Sister Juanita Word is mourning the sudden loss of her son, Frederick Word. And Jerry Wicks continues to mourn for her husband, Brother Brian. For more information about these announcements and to get a bird's eye view of all the church activities, we invite you to visit our website and follow us on social media. This concludes the announcements for Sunday, January 15, 2023. Have a blessed week. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And at this time, please prepare your heart for a visual and musical commemoration of the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.
one of Dr. King's, one of his favorite songs, If I Can Help Somebody. Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah. Thank you. As we continue on in thinking about the fact that we are celebrating his life tomorrow, also take it into account that that is a national day of service and try to see if you can find something to be in service for. We are at the time where I get to introduce the pastor of today. So before I go into his bio, I will say that this young man is full of more energy than all of us combined in this room. We had a delightful time with him yesterday during the meet and greet where he was able to answer some of our questions 
And we just had a great time of fellowship from the Friday time all the way through. So we are definitely looking forward to what God has placed on his heart to bring to us today. He's a product of Dallas Public Schools. The Reverend Jonathan Wilkins is a proud husband of Paris Wilkins. And I may say that again, he is a very proud husband of his, <laughs> his wife, Paris Wilkins. He is the father of Yuri Jonathan Jr. Princeton, and in April, they will welcome their fourth child and third son as the newest family member. He is the son of Dr. Kathy Wilkins Moffitt and the grandson of the late Reverend Harvest Thomas Wilkins Sr., who pastored over 40 years in the AME Zion Church. Reverend Wilkins is a legacy bearer, tirelessly pursuing a pastoral call to serve God's people. The journey led him to Morehouse College, where he earned a BA in general management and onward to Harvard to complete four years of rigorous graduate study. He became the only student in his class to earn a Master of Divinity from the Harvard Divinity School and a Master of Business Administration from Harvard Business School. Reverend Wilkins was ordained as a Baptist member under his mentor, Reverend Dr. Charles G. Adams, who helped Reverend Wilkins discover the awesome responsibility of being a servant leader. Serving others has taught him one fundamental fact. People do not care what you know until they know that you care. God has opened doors for Reverend Wilkins to utilize a unique combination of business and theology and pastoral ministry, community and economic development, and leadership development. He has pastored in Atlanta, Boston, and in Chicago, he served as a chaplain for the Chicago Bears NFL team. He has helped fund over $100 million in mixed-use affordable housing development, he shared some of that with us yesterday, and manage uh, world-class real estate property, properties over the country. He continues to grow in his current role as manager with Deloitte's leadership and learning consulting practice, helping Fortune 100 executives best equip their people through innovative learning development. Reverend Wilkins comes to this moment with a deep appreciation for God's grace and the journey and a sincere appreciation for heritage's storied history and tremendous hopes and genuine hospitality. He is honored by the invitation to share with you today. So after a sermonic selection from our choir, the next voice you will hear will be that of Reverend Jonathan Wilkins. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Today, all day long, we are singing, we are praising, we are thanking God for his unmerited favor in our lives. We are praising him for his amazing grace. The song says, where would I be if not for your grace? Where would I be?
many of you know if it had not been for the Lord on your side old folks used to say when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he has done for me my soul is that your testimony today that when you think about how good God has been the ways he has made, the doors 
he has opened. I don't know about you, but my soul cries out, hallelujah. Praise God for saving me. There is a sweet spirit in this place. And I don't know what, what need you came to this church today with, but God says, I'm here to meet your need. I'm here to meet your need. Somebody has been praying. Somebody has been crying before the Lord. Somebody has been believing God for something special to happen. And I come to bear witness that God is able. And not only, can I just talk for a little bit, not only is he able, but he's willing. You see, some folk are able and unwilling. But God is able and he's willing. Lift your hands all over this sanctuary. Gracious God that you are, we humble ourselves before you, recognizing that you are the point of all agendas. Your grace, your mercy, your love, your kindness. Your love is awesome and expansive. And God, we just want to thank you for your patience with us. Thank you for hitting the pause button on what we have planned in order to show us who you are, who we are, who we can be. Thank you, Lord God, for your sweet presence in this place. I pray that you would pick this building up today, that you would touch every life, every mind, every marriage, every child, every senior citizen, every adult. In the name of Jesus, we thank you in advance for what you're about to do. And I thank you that the devil is shaking in his boots because of the authority of Jesus Christ. Give God the best praise you got right there. Not because you feel like it, but because you know he's worthy to be praised. Hallelujah anyhow. Hallelujah anyhow. Hallelujah anyhow. Does anybody have a hallelujah anyhow? I know it don't always feel good, but when I think of his goodness and all that he's been, a wonderful thing to be in the sanctuary. Did the, did the clock already start? <laughs> Jesus. I'm full, y'all. You may be seated. I'm full this morning. And I just, can we celebrate the music ministry? Oh, my goodness. Lord, have mercy. Such musicianship. Such high quality high class. Everybody was on point. And listen, I stuck around for practice. I can't sing. But I can pray, amen. And I stuck around for practice just to hear what y'all was going to sing. Y'all snuck one in on me now. That was so amazing. And then the sister on the drums, come on here. Lord have mercy. Listen, you got that swag. You hear me? <laughs> you got that swag. I love it. Musicians, y'all are blessing everybody. To the board of directors, to the deacons, to the volunteers, to the ushers board. They told me y'all got at least 50 ushers. Um, to, to everybody, the folks in the booth, the folks handling the sound. I, I mean... I could go on and on, but I am hallelujah happy. Peacock proud to be here with you today. And I'm going to tell y'all a little something before I just give God praise for my family. I, I, uh, Reverend Tate said to pull this one out. Pull this, pull this desk out. And, and when I did sound check, uh, I realized it was up to my chest.
Y'all want a seat? Let me, let me just show you. I said, now, Lord. <laughs> I can barely see the door. And look, y'all, I had a nightmare last night. <laughs> had a nightmare. I went to bed. I closed my eyes, and I woke up thinking, I need a leg up or something. So I said to myself, let me get some water. I said to myself, uh, self, we going to get there extra early and see if we can catch up with Gil and, and see if there's a step up platform. Amen, somebody. So do you mind if I stand tall today? Is that all right? I'm going to stand tall today. Is that all right? Got to stand on what you can stand on. Amen. Some of y'all are standing on his promises. Amen. Listen, I'm not going to hold you long, but I do want to acknowledge my better half carrying my third son. Um, she, you know, this, I wish this was my line, but I'm going to adopt it. She sweetens my oatmeal sweetens my personality and I am grateful that you were willing to put all of your cards on me it's a wonderful thing when and I can't speak for other cultures I appreciate other cult cultures but it's a wonderful thing when a black woman bets on you thank you to all of the young Married husbands, you got to set that thing up for later. Amen. I love you very much. To my beautiful children, to my loving family, can we give everybody who flew in just a quick round of applause? If you want to stand, let me see y'all. Everybody who flew in, everybody who's from the DMV, I went to school with some of you all. I've got line brothers here, alpha brothers all over the sanctuary. My line brothers are right there. Good Lord, man. Y'all showed up and showed out. Y'all know I love y'all. Y'all know Kesey came in from New York. You got people here from Norfolk. Uh, you got people that drove distances to be. It's a wonderful thing when people are willing to come out because people don't have to do what they do for you. You do know that. So it's a wonderful thing. And I just have to tell you, Heritage, you are a wonderful church. Can I say that for the people in the back? You are a wonderful church. And I am grateful for it, your hospitality, everything that you have done, every moment that we've shared. It has meant the world to my family and I. And I want you to know that I really appreciate your presence, your love. Your now, Heritage is going to have some questions for you. Heritage Fellowship Church. I got here at 8.30 yesterday, and our session must have started at 9.30, and uh, we went into question and answer. How many of you were here yesterday? Let me see. Yeah. Went into the question and answer, <laughs> and uh, I looked up, and uh, it was three and a half hours in. And I said, now, Lord, now, and I felt my virtue leaving. Because I was hungry. I've been eating salads and, I, you know, tree bark and leaves. I've been fasting, right? And I looked over at Reverend Tate. He said, now, look, now, I'm hungry, okay? It's 1230. What other questions y'all got? Now, let me say something. I'm going to say something. Thank you for your questions. I still got questions, too. I, wanna, I want, for a few minutes after church, I want to meet with as many of you as I can. Because I really want to understand your viewpoint, your story. What brought you to this church? What has kept you in this church? Those are the two questions I have. So as many of you as available, I'd love to just see you after service. Is that all right, church? I, I don't want to keep you too much for brunch. I know you got brunch and football and AAU games and all that. But I do want to see you. Is that all right, church? Amen. Give God praise, glory, and honor for his goodness. Scripture this morning comes from 2 Kings chapter 4, not going to be long at all, very familiar passage of Scripture, 2 Kings chapter 4, 
verses 1 through 7. If I missed anything or anybody, know that I love you entirely. How many of you came with a great expectation this morning? Amen. <laughs> Again, 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 1 through 7. They do have it on the screens. It says, the wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, your servant. My, my husband is dead. And you know that he revered the Lord, but now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. Elisha replied to her, how can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing there at all, she said, except a small jar of oil. A small jar of olive oil. Elisha said, go around and ask your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside, shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour oil into our, all the jars. Somebody say, pour oil. And as, as each is filled, put one to the side. She left him. and Shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her, and she kept pouring. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, bring me another one. But he replied, there is not another jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. She went and told the man of God, and he said, go sell the oil. Pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what's left. Time desires to share. I'd like to preach from the subject, one more step. Somebody say, one more step. Let me pray one more time. Father, help us today. In Jesus' name, somebody say amen. You may be seated really quickly. I want to acknowledge the interim pastor, Dr. Julian Dangerfield, in his absence to his beautiful bride. Uh, I don't know if he knows it yet, but I've already adopted him as an, uh, a big brother, one way or another. Amen, somebody. Honor the Lord for his consistent faithfulness. Wherever you are, sir, we honor you. To those of you watching online, thank you and welcome to this wonderful service. I would open by suggesting that people all over the world are suffering in silence. Silence and isolation. The U.S. News reported that one out of every ten people are suffering from depression. What does that equate to in real numbers? What that equates to, if you assume that there are 300 million people in the U.S., that means there are 30 million people who are broken, 30 million people who are hurting, 30 million people who are suffering in silence. The loss, perhaps, of a loved one during the pandemic, the, the loss of, perhaps, a job opportunity from corporations who are already starting to downsize ahead of the Great Recession, the loss of, perhaps, unattainable retirement, because of downgrade of stocks, market indexes, the loss of dreams due to inflation, which in many ways has pushed what would have been a first home for a young couple out of reach. No, 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 people are, are depressed and lonely and on the verge of suicide in many cases. We saw the news of Twitch, and I cannot tell you how much that broke my whole heart. See a brother suffering in silence leave his family after dancing with them 24 hours earlier. Leave his family unannounced and go and take his life. And, and let me just pause there to suggest God is not pleased with that. That while we are in church trying to get ourselves together, there are people in the world who need Jesus Christ. In these confusing times of moral ambiguity, historical anonymity, and personal perplexity, our families need to be reminded when life happens, and requires a transition, God
God's presence will meet us at the point of our need. Somebody ought to say amen right there. Family is so important. What holds families together? It is the love, the values, the customs, and the memories, the, the, the tragedies, the challenges that we endure that are shared from one generation to the next. Some years ago, I visited my late grandfather, uh, paternal grandfather, Reverend Harvest Wilkins Sr., before he transitioned, and I was flipping through a few of his sermons, and I came across a theological concept called prevenient grace. Somebody say prevenient grace. It is the kind of grace that anticipates your need before you need anything. Prevenient grace is the kind of grace that God arranges over the course of your life to meet you at the appointment of your need. It is God's arrangement of help across your life to, 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 that he orders in order for you to realize it when you don't think any help is available. Family in our text is in need of grace. Family in our text is facing a crisis and in need of help. An untimely loss has devastated the family, leaving a wife mourning her husband Two sons mourning their father. They are left only with yesterday's memories of his impact in their lives. A life partner, a soul mate. A loving father has transitioned and a wife whose identity has now shifted to be a widow must now fend for her family alone, rely on others for support, and attempt to navigate a patriarchal society that does not value her and certainly doesn't value widows. Consequently, the family is broke and has outstanding debts that the husband left behind. Creditor has threatened to seize her two sons as slaves, which was legal in order to pay the debts. And I don't know about you, but that is triggering for me when I consider that just steps from here, slaves were dropped off in 1619. She is out of time, out of resources. There is no college fund. There is no life insurance. There is no investment fund. There is no retirement fund. There is no health savings fund, no trust fund, no PPO, no HMO, just a whole lot of NOOs. And who's to blame? Y'all know we play the blame game. Is it him, the, the brother with bad credit, or is it her who doesn't know what to do next. Either way, when you are done playing the blame game, I'm learning that if the problem is still the same, what are we talking about? Because the question becomes, Lord, what are we going to do now? Can I talk just a little bit? Have you ever been there in a time in your life where everything you expected to happen fell apart? You didn't know what to say. You didn't know what to do because you never saw it coming. Nobody gave you a warning. Nobody sent you notice. Nobody sent you an email. Nobody sent you a text me message. You just woke up and there it was. It's amazing how you can spend years building something that falls apart in a matter of moments. One incident can change the course of your life. One incident can make you drop to your knees and ask God, where are you in the midst of all of this? One incident, a challenge with unexpected crises that hit our lives is that life does not stop because you lost something. Life does not stop because you don't feel good. Life doesn't stop. The problems continuously pile up. And for her, she is feeling all of it. Hadn't, hadn't she sacrificed enough? I think about Coretta Scott King. Hadn't she sacrificed enough? He served faithfully. And she supported him. And now in our text, the creditor is coming to take her two sons. Oh, 
but not without a fight. Not without a fight. Make no mistake about it, you'd be hard-pressed to find someone more defiant than a fed-up mother. Fed-up mothers will switch into combat mode. Fed-up mothers will turn into MMA fighters. Fed-up mothers will, will put their dukes up if you think for one moment you're going to put your hands or a finger on their child. Let all the fed-up mothers say amen. <laughs> fed-up parents will move mountains and planets if necessary. And I wish you would roll up on a fed-up mother. You might walk up, but you're going to limp back. Hey, we're going to call this woman Miss Widow. Somebody say Miss Widow. Miss Widow has had it. She is on a mission to confront Elisha the prophet, and when she finds him, she cries out to him, your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know he loved God. You know he served faithfully. He did all of the things right. And you mean to tell me he's not only dead, but now they're coming to take the only children I have left? Oh, no, sir. If you, if you, if you read Scripture long enough, if you read it too, allow God to release the anguish and the grief from your space. Can I just talk to somebody? Elisha, whose name means God is salvation, saw the sorrow in the present. After hearing her out, he opens the door of possibility and personal responsibility and asks her, how can I help you? Side note, when God's love is in your heart, your question should be different. When God's love is in your heart, you, you don't have the right to be nosy. At some point... You have to begin to make it about God's people and not your agenda. Maybe. There's, there's no response to his first question. I think that's important. Maybe because it's possible to be so overwhelmed by life and loss that when somebody asks you how they can help you genuinely, you may not even know where to start. Anybody ever been there? And you were going through so much that you didn't know where to start if somebody said, what you need, baby? I don't know what I need. All this hell I got going on, I don't know where to start. And I love it because Elisha, look at this, Elisha doesn't allow her lack of response to keep him from, from pushing his, his investigation. He doesn't allow her inability to articulate her pain to stop him from pushing past her silence in order to help her heal from it. It's a wonderful thing when you've got people in your life who can say, I hear you. I see you. I understand you. And I'm here to help you. Amen, somebody? He says, how can I help? He persists with empathy, and he doesn't allow her silence to stop his investigation. In her book, Christian Responses to Poverty, Susan Holman makes a distinction, hear this, between sympathy and empathy. Sympathy, she says, is the distance feeling for someone. But empathy participates in the thinking or the emotions of another. To empathize, to sympathize is to feel for. To empathize is to relate to where sympathy expresses feelings, empathy expresses action. And I, I, can't speak, I can't speak for you, but I can speak for myself. When I'm going through hell's furnace of affliction, I don't need your dialectical critique of my problem. I don't need your critical analysis of my background. When I'm going through hell and high water, I need you, we need you, they need you to tell them how God can make a way out of no way. They need, we need you to tell them how God brought you through the furnace without smoke on your coat. Anybody can offer an opinion. Not everybody can offer support. I wish we had more people who would offer support, lead with love rather than leading with an opinion. Elisha, Elisha persists with empathy. And he asks her another question that I dare ask this church today. 
What do you have in your house? What do you have of value that God can use in your house? You got to watch questions from people who know God because the answer may be a part of the solution. Ooh, let me just cut clean across the field and tell somebody that it is possible for your problem and the solution to be one and the same. Your lack becomes availability for God to do what God is going to do in your life. So if you find yourself with just a little bit of oil, you find yourself with just a little bit of faith, know this, church, that God is able to make up every gap in your life. How many of you are a witness to that? Hallelujah. Anyhow, it's not lost on us. What she says is all I have is just a little jar of oil. When you translate that word jar, we come to understand that the Hebrew word for jar in this text comes from the word anointing oil. In essence, she's saying all I have is a single jar of ceremonial oil. How she feels. It is not lost on us. How she feels is also reflective of what she has. Given the loss, the grief, the anxiety over family threats to her two sons, I would dare guess that she must have been overwhelmed and under-resourced. <laughs> we, if we are not careful how we feel, can I say this? How we feel about where we are can impair what we see. If we are not careful, how we feel about our circumstance can impair our ability to see any value in what we have. If we are not careful, how we feel about our circumstance will cause us to second guess what God has already given us. But Elisha, I love it because Elisha sees it differently and everybody in this room need somebody that's not only in their corner, but in their space. Not only in their space, but in their corner. Because people like that see things differently. People like Elisha see the glass as being half full instead of half empty. People like Elisha will look at our circumstances and say, I know how you feel, my brother. I know how you feel, my sister. I know based upon what you see that you cannot see anything great coming from this moment. But I'm here to tell you that there is still value in this church. There's still value in your faith. There is still value in your prayer life. There's still value in your marriage. There's still value in your children. Still value. He knew. He knew. He knew that the oil was enough. We all need people like that. And to Elisha, the oil was just right. He knew that God was not only transcendent, but that God was imminent. He is always near us. Elijah knew that God is not cheap, God is not stingy, and God knows that God is not guilty of non-support. He knew that there are no deficits in God's economy. He knew that there are no deficiency in God, deficiencies in God's treasury. He knew that there are no shortages in God's supplies. He knew, that there, he knew that there are no insufficiencies in God's love. You can take it all to the bank. Because we know that God, God's shelves are always full. God's grace is always sufficient. God's love is always wonderful. And God is always enough. When Elisha, who am I preaching to today? Is this all right? When Elisha, when Elisha heard about her oil, and heard about what she had left, he recognized God's provisional clue that there was more where that came from. That if you have something, that is an indicator that God has more. 
Because you and I know that God gave you everything you have today. All that you are. When I look at your history, all that you are, all that you hope to be, everything that you have, God gave it to you. So that if he gave it to you at one point, God can do it again. I double dog ice cream dare you to believe that God can do it, do it again. I love it because he challenged the family to have an act of faith. He said, I need everybody involved. I need you and your children to be involved in the process of fighting for your freedom. I love it because he, he sends the entire family on a mission to achieve their own freedom. It's not that, the, isn't that, is that not the struggle of our ancestors? Is that not the heritage of our collective history given to us by the example of your founders? We know how to jump off of nowhere and land on somewhere. We know how to take nothing and make something. We know how to take a negative cross it over with amazing grace and make it a positive in the meantime. We know how to take hog guts and make a full course meal. We know how to take pot liquor, turn it into vitamins and minerals and nutritious foods and folic acids, antioxidants. We know how to take adversity, turn it into advantage. We know how to take sorrow and turn it into songs. We also know that life, I feel my help today. I don't know who's been praying. Life is not just a bucket of response. It's not just a bucket of blessings, but with every privilege comes responsibility. Can I talk just a little bit? Ladies and gentlemen, whenever you have a theology, an understanding of God. That's what the, it's the study of God. Whenever you have a theology that, that gives you privileges without responsibility, that's a bad theology. Am I talking to somebody? Yeah, in any job, any job that gives you privileges without responsibilities is a bad job. Can I help some single sister right here? Any relationship that gives you privileges. Some young marriage needs to understand that there are responsibilities that come with your connection to somebody else. We know that in Luke chapter 12, verse 48, to whom much is given, much is required. I, I know, that's what Elisha was saying. I know, I know you're hurt. I know it's been tough. I know it's been hard. But let me remind you, as I remind this church, you are still a child of God. You are not helpless. You are not hopeless. You are not defeated. You are not deficient. You are not deleted. You are not destroyed. God is not dead, and neither are you. Help me, Holy Ghost. You still, you're still a child of God heritage. You still have a mind to think with. You still have a heart to feel with. You still have hands to pray with. You still got a soul to answer to God. February 1968, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. published something called the Economic Bill of Rights may not be able to find it online because they didn't want us to understand the full thrust of it. But it included several tenets that every American has the right to a job, adequate wages, decent living, decent homes, medical care, economic protection during sickness, and a quality education. This plan was not just about praying about things. This plan was about hoping for change and putting feet on the ground by combining theological principles with tactical strategy. Elisha, in his approach and consultation to this sister who's struggling from loss, invokes theology and the tactical to offer a, her a, a plan. Somebody say a plan. He offers three steps. Three steps. 
He says, go borrow. You see it there. Go borrow as many vessels as you can from your neighbors. What a strange, strange command that is. Empty vessels. Why not borrow vessels with something in them? Because, beloved, that's not freedom. If you have to go into debt trying to get out of debt, that's not freedom. That's bondage. Instead of borrowing from others, because you know how others can be when they look for, their, for what you borrowed from them back. If you borrow vessels with something in them, you accumulate no, more debt. Rather than borrowing oil, he says, I want you to borrow capacity. Borrow from your community and expand your ability to receive what's coming. There's, there's no use in God giving you more of anything if you don't have the faith and infrastructure to receive it. Borrowing capacity means being humble enough to admit you don't have it all together. Can I say that again for the people outside? Borrowing capacity means asking for help when you don't have it all together. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6 says, Humble yourself up under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due season. That was the power of the bus boycotts. That was the power of sit-ins. That was the power of the civil rights movement and the poor people's campaign. They built alliances, broadened their base, and went wherever help was needed. This is what phased faithfulness looks like. This is what phased faithfulness looks like, taking active steps to prepare for what's coming. Borrowing capacity means stepping outside of your comfort zone, expanding your network, investing in relationships, reconnecting with communities you don't normally engage with, extending your net, enlarging your territory. Borrowing capacity requires focus. You cannot worry about how people look at you because you know people will look at you crazy cannot worry about what people's opinions are. Do not, Dr. Adams said, do not be discouraged by those who build oppressive walls of hateful denial around the tender stems of your hopes, ambitions, and aspirations. Be faithful. Gather your vessels. Let God take care of the results. Somebody say step two. Elisha instructed her to take the vessels along with her two sons. Go inside and shut the door. Somebody say shut the door. She was just outside in the community, and now God is calling her inside to be with her family. I'm reminded that Ecclesiastes 3 and 13 says, to everything there is a season. To everything there is a season. There's a time to be outside, and there's a time to be inside. It's a time to be around people, but then there's a time to shut the door. Culture says, leave the door unlocked. Just put a key under the mat. R&B says, leave the door cracked. Bruno Mars said, leave the door open. But God told this single woman, shut the door. Don't open the door. Don't crack the door. Shut the door. One of, one of, one of life's greatest gifts, Sister Stephanie, one of life's greatest gifts is to, the ability to hit the pause button. Psalm 25, 14 says, The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. There are some things that God shows his people that he doesn't show anybody else. There are some things that God will show you when you are by yourself. And let me say this, there are some things God will tell you that he doesn't want you to tell anybody else. That sometimes when we receive what we think is a revelation from God, we should keep quiet and ask God to reveal his plan for us. Sometimes, can I say this? I'm adopted today, so I can say it. Sometimes we get in God's way. Sometimes. Not all the time, and maybe not even this church. Sometimes. We do too much. As my, as my daughter, my 18-year-old Spellman, freshman daughter would say, sometimes you're doing the most. Sometimes when we claim 
that God is in, God is out. Because we come to situations, I shared this with the church yesterday, if you've missed it, here it is again. Sometimes we, we need to understand that, that everything we bring, we need to understand what we bring to conversations. We bring our family background, our educational background. We, we bring our religious background. We, we, we bring our, our cultural backgrounds. We bring, we bring the school background that we went to. We bring, we bring how we were raised to the conversation. And if you're not careful, you will call something God that is your, just your opinion. If you're not careful, you will get in a space where you start talking about what God said and only to realize that you might be, you might be mistaken. Because if love is not in your heart, and if God is not the focus, and if others are not on your mind, you might be saying, you, and, and see, I, I, can I just be honest? I've been, a, I've, I've, been, uh, I've been there where I felt like God told me something. Only to realize I was wrong. And I'm realizing now more than ever, you got to be willing to say, you know what? I got that wrong. I, 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 didn't, I didn't read that situation right. And can I help somebody? It doesn't, it don't cost you nothing to say I'm sorry. It, it don't cost you nothing to say, you know what? I, my bad. And let me tell you something. You might feel a little bit better. Because forgiveness has more to do with you. Let me keep moving for y'all throw me out of here. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing when God tells you to close the door. It's a wonderful thing when God calls you to a space where you, you shut the laptop off. Shut your telephone down. Maybe even delete Facebook altogether. Because if that has your attention more than God, what are you thinking about? Let me keep going. Because when you're really God's child, God will reveal God's self to you and your family. Somebody say, shut the door. Almost done. Set, third step is, it's the hardest step. Pour oil into all the vessels problematic action item on her list of to-dos. They are in the house, but there is no more oil. The instructions did not include oil acquisition, oil exploration. It did not include onshore or offshore drilling. She had the capacity. She has the help. But where? is the rest of the oil. I got all these vessels and nothing to put in them. Where is the rest of, have you ever been there? Where you feel like God impressed upon your heart to go back to school, but there's no money. Have you ever been there? When you looked at <laughs> what you needed and did the math on what you had, and it was clear that what you had doesn't add up. Have you ever been there? And maybe, maybe for you it's not money. But, but, but maybe, maybe it's patience. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's faith. Maybe it's your mind. The mind you need is nowhere near the mind that's required. Let me keep going. Instructions did not include anything that would produce oil. She had what she needed, and the challenge is trusting God when there's no answer in sight. How can this be? How, how, is, this, how is this possible? My late preaching professor, the Reverend Peter, Peter, Peter Gomes, minister of Harvard Memorial Chapel, wrote a series of sermons. He wrote a series of sermons explaining biblical miracles. He said, people often have a problem with biblical miracles in the Bible because we live in a postmodern society. We have all this science, all of this technology, and we have all these things at our disposal. And we come to the text with our postmodern mindsets and bring our rationality, our sensibilities, and our logic to these stories. So it's hard sometimes to wrestle with the fact that God has the proclivity 
and the propensity to take two, piece, two pieces of tilapia. <laughs> two biscuits from Red Lobster. And multiply them to feed 5,000. When we approach the text with our rationality, all of our education and all of our, our sensibilities, we often ask, how can this be? How is this possible? Peter Gomes suggests that if you walk up on a miracle text and ask the wrong question, you will walk away with the wrong answer. Instead of asking, how can this be? How is this possible? Maybe, just maybe, we should be asking, what does this mean? What does this text mean? Forget how is this possible. What does it mean for your family? What does it mean for your church? What does it mean for your community? I'm glad you asked the question. What it means, what it means, my beloved, is that sometimes you have more than you think you do. What it means is that there was one more step. What it means is that sometimes God will wait until you have exhausted all of your efforts before he steps in and intervenes. There was one more step. This step was not her step. This step was God's step. Johann van Gogh says, at the moment of committal, the entire universe conspires to your success. One more step. One mother and two sons, which means they had a quorum for God's presence. When the family poured what they had, the ultimate chemist changed the molecular structure of this oil. The more she poured, the more he multiplied. The more she gave in, the more he provided. The more she, she put out there, the more he put into God's provenient grace. Met this family the moment they committed to their last instruction. When she started pouring, she was broke and broken. When she started pouring, she was indebted and in doubt. When she started pouring, the creditor was coming for her two children. But by the time she stopped pouring, God had made the entire family whole. By the time she stopped pouring, she was able to retire early from oil production. When she stopped pouring, she had secured her children's safety. And when she stopped pouring, she had an endowment for two generations. Who am I preaching to today? Lord, have mercy. <laughs> I'll never forget the first time I had to trust God for myself. Senior at Morehouse College. Church say amen. It was the fall semester of my senior year. I was full of dreams, but depleted of financial resources. I had an outstanding tuition balance. School has sent word to my family that if we could not come up with the money, I would have to pack my things up and go home which would mean I would not be able to graduate. I had the grades. I was an active servant leader, servant leader on campus. I just didn't have the money. Let me ask you again, have you ever just been at a point where you didn't have it? Yeah. Monday came. It was due Friday. Anybody ever had Monday come? Tuesday went. Anybody ever had tw Tuesday to go? Wednesday Wednesday passed, Thursday ended, Friday morning. I woke up and still didn't have the money, but I had a question on my heart. And that question was, is there anything too hard? For God. Got on my knees, 
and I prayed. My family and I had been fasting all week, and when I got up, I decided that I was going to go ask for the money. Matthew 7 and 8, you know how you had to have scriptures when you're in trouble. <laughs> Matthew 7 and 7 says, ask and ye shall seek and ye shall knock and the door will put on my best shirt and tie. I think I might have had some khaki dockers on walking down middle of campus. Y'all know, all the Morehouse men know that, that long hill down campus. I walked down the hill. I looked at Dr. King pointing. He was pointing at the financial aid office. <laughs> Lord have mercy. I just got that from heaven. That just blessed my soul. He was pointing over there. Walked in the office, sat down, waited my turn. Uh, no, no, no appointment. Just a question. No, 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 no agenda. Just one, just one, just one question. Waited what must have felt like three hours. Back then, they didn't have all the technology they have now, y'all. You had to wait in line. You had to manually add and drop. I mean, we had to get slips go to the professors and beg the professor to let you drop the class and then you had to wait for them to put a signature on the slip go to the gym and the gym line was four hours long because everybody was looking for the same level of grace you were who am I preaching to am I talking to some real people you know what I'm talking about if you went to a black school you know let the church say amen. But I sat there. Sometimes you have to wait on God. Sometimes it's just good to sit quietly and wait on God's help. I sat there. They called my name. One of the sweetest sounds I've ever heard in my life. I didn't think they were going to ever call my name. They called me into the office. Remember, I'll never forget Mr. James Stotts. The short man, maybe shorter than me. I'm just joking. He called me in and I, I went to explain. I said, look, man, I can't go home because I know God has. Y'all have, have to excuse me because it's, <laughs> it's a wonderful thing when God brings you full circle. What you cried about at one point becomes an opportunity for God to show you who he is. I said, I've got the grades, man. I've got the dreams. Freshman class president, junior class president. I'm active on campus. I said, but I've got a need. He said, he said, that's interesting you should say that. He said, because I've heard about you. I've already, I've already heard your story. Heritage, can I say that? You, you, God has already heard about you. <laughs> and what you don't know is God already has arrangements. <laughs> you, you ain't, you ain't, you ain't, you ain't got to do nothing extra. All you got to do is wait and see. Can I talk to some real people? Can I just, because I've heard your heart this weekend. All you got to do is trust God. You ain't got to do nothing further, as the old folks say. You ain't got to have another further. He said, he said, I've heard about you. And luckily for you, Oprah Winfrey has just donated a million dollars for students just like you. So not only, not only, I'm almost done, not only is your balance paid, but you on time for graduation. This ain't even the best part. 
This ain't even the best part. I'll never forget coming down on graduation day. 500 black men. Black men that society says can't be nothing. Black men that says they can't be faithful husbands and can't be faithful to their children. Black men walking down the middle of campus to some African drums. I'll never forget the sound of those drums. We walked down the middle of campus and I looked toward King's Chapel. And this, there was this little old lady jumping up and down, praising God for what God had done. And the closer we got, the more I realized, somebody said, well, whose mama is that? <laughs> it was my mama thanking God for his prevenient grace. I don't know who's in the room today. But God said, the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. Look at somebody and say, the best. Isn't that just like God? Just when you think it's over. Just when you feel like you are fresh out of your oil. Just when you, can't have, you don't have anything left to give. God says there's more where that came from. More grace, more joy, more hope, more love, more purpose. Someone needs to know you plus it is almost nothing. But it plus God is everything. No words. <laughs> no words can explain it. No theory can contain it. No rules can restrict it. No tyrants can prevent it. No adversaries can defeat it. No sickness can overwhelm it. No enemy can overthrow it. No missile can overtake it. No death can overcome it. No problem can overdepress it. No power can destroy it. No bullet can shoot it. No fire can burn it. No trouble can stop it. Is that your testimony this morning? I wish I had two or three people who would jump up on your feet because you know it was the grace and the mercy of God that saved your life, saved your soul, saved your mind, saved your marriage, saved your church. He's healing you. He's keeping you. He's carrying you. The Mississippi Mass Choir said, your grace and mercy brought me through. I'm living this moment because of you. And I want to thank you and praise you too for your grace and mercy has brought me through. Oh, I wish I had 10,000 tongues. I wish I had 10,000 tongues just to thank God for his goodness. If I were Chinese, I would say, oh dear. If I were Danish, I'd say, mangatat. If I were Italian, I'd say, grazia. If I were Hebrew, I'd say, toda raba. If I were Greek, I would say Eucharisto. If I were Japanese, I'd say Domo Arigato. If I were Portuguese, I'd say Obligado. If I were Spanish, I'd say Muchas Gracias. If I were French, I'd say Merci Beaucoup. If I were German, I'd say Danke schön. If I were Russian, I'd say Spasiva. If I were Kenyan, I'd say Ashanta. If I were Nigerian, I'd say Ashe Pupo Modupe. If I were if I were Ghanaian, I'd say Medasi Mapi. If I was Zulu, I'd say Inyi Abonga. If I was Zutu, I'd say Kayali Boha. If I were deaf, I'd say, just like my mama, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your Thank you, Jesus. Anybody 
thankful for his grace this morning anybody thankful for his love this morning anybody thankful for his peace this morning come on lift those hands up before God to know y'all can sing that your your oil is enough what you have left is more than enough for God to work with and 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 look I've heard you all weekend I know how you feel God knows how you feel but God also knows that your problem and your solution are one and the same. Just when you don't have, just when you think you don't have anything left, God says, if I gave you that, I can give you more. So can I say this in full faith? Heritage, I need you to hold on to your faith. I, I, need, I need you to come together in a way that you have never come together before. I, I need you, I need you as your adopted son to trust God and trust that God is in control. I, I, need, I need you to trust whatever God's process is and know that God knows how to multiply his answer in your life. That while you are looking at a tree he is clear on the entire forest. That while you were looking at an incident, God is clear about your future. And all you need to do, look, 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 you ain't even got to believe it all the way. But if you act like you're going to pour, if you can just get in position, can I talk to this church? If you can just posture yourself to believe God, God says at the moment you don't even trust me to pour it all. I'm going to add to it. I'm going to multiply it. I'm going to show you that I'm God of your future. I'm God of your present. And I'm God of your tomorrow. Listen, I want to open the doors of this church. I want to take a moment as you rise to your feet all over this sanctuary. I don't know who is in the building today. But this word was tailor-made for you. You have been looking at your situation one way. And God is saying to you and I, you, are, you got your focus on the wrong thing. That it is possible to minor, to major in the minor. But God said it's time for you to pivot your perspective to understand that I have a holistic strategy that includes your entire deliverance. That you cannot, mac you cannot, hear me, you cannot manufacture what only God can give. Can I say that again? Cannot manufacture what only God can give. And, and what is man that thou art mindful of him? that God would think enough of you and I to put us in a space where we both have to trust God for what's next. Because you do know, somebody say, there is a next. There is another chapter. And I dare to say in faith for this church, what if your better days are ahead of you? Can I, let me say this. What if your worst days are behind you? Oh. What if? See, you have to believe what you don't see. You have to believe what you've yet to experience. And you have to trust God to close the gap between your experience and his divine intervention. Amen, church? Maybe you're here. Maybe you're here and you don't know the Lord. Maybe you're here and you had not accepted the Lord into your life. I'm here to, to tell you as a witness 
you were missing one of the greatest gifts of all life. The gift of grace, the gift of salvation is one that we should all accept as our personal invitation. If you're here and you perhaps need to accept the Lord into your heart, I'm going to invite you to meet me here at this altar. Maybe you're here, perhaps, and you're saying, well, preacher, this, this ain't my first rodeo. I understand. Been there, done that. But I'm here to tell you, in 2023, you need to, lo- you need to know Jesus. And sometimes we need a second, third, fourth, fifth invitation to come to God and give God our hearts. If that's you, as they play this song real softly, I want to invite you to come. If you do not know Jesus and you want to accept him in the pardon of your sin, come on down that aisle. Come on down. I see you coming, brother. Come on down. Anybody else? Is there anybody else? Come on. You ought to be rejoicing right there. Come on here. Come on. 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 Come on down here and get some of this. God bless you. Is there another? Is there another? Come on down. Darren and his mama coming back to the church. Come on. Come on, brother. Come on down here, brother. Come on home, brother. Come on home, brother. God bless you, man. Is there anybody else? Anybody else? Is there anybody else? Listen, if we ain't got time for this, we ain't got time for nothing. We are in the business of seeing souls saved. Is there another? Is there another? Is there another? Hallelujah, anyhow. Is there another? Hallelujah. Listen, let me me do this. How many sense God moving? I mean, if you know God is here, listen, if you're here and God is knocking on the door of your heart, I don't want you to be embarrassed or to feel like somebody's calling you out. But I'm here to tell you, when God provides an eternal invitation, you ought to respond because you, you don't know what tomorrow holds. You don't know what the future holds, but we do know who holds our future. Amen, church? So if you're here, I want to give you a couple more seconds to come and to give your life to Jesus, who is the author and the finisher. God loves you. God cares for you. I don't know what the pro- what's the protocol for, for these that we are receiving today. Come on, give, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Listen, I'm not going to hold you long. Two more things I want to do. I want to pray. I want to pray for anybody. Yeah, go ahead. They're just coming back to Christ. Come on, man. Let me get a hug. I'm going to drop my glasses. Let me get a hug, man. I'm, I'm a little sweaty. I'll just give you some doubt, man. Is that all right? Bless you, brother. Bless your mother. Oh, it's good to see you again. She said, I never left. I know that's right, mother. God bless you, Dan. God bless you, brother. Come on, give them another round of applause. Listen, real quick. God is good. I want to I tell this church, I want to pray really quickly for everybody who is connected to this church. And I want to invite you really quickly, for those of you who want to come to the altar, to come to the altar at this time as we look to God in prayer. If you want to come, you can stay where you are or you can come to the altar. But I want to extend an invitation for those of you who want prayer, who feel like this word was exactly for you. I want you to come at this time as we look to God in prayer. Is that okay, church? Come on down. Play that loud for me. Go ahead. Yeah. That word was for me. I just, I'm looking for God to do something in my life. I believe in God for something special for my family. I'm looking for God to close the gap in my life. Come on down. No harm. No foul. Come on down. Whoever wants to come to the altar of sacrifice lane. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. 
Come on, come on down, come on down, come on down. Come on down, there's room at the altar. There's room at the altar, there's room at the altar. There's room at the altar. There's room at the altar. Every head bowed and every eye closed. I feel the presence of the living God. There's some folk at this altar who have been hurt by life. There are some folk in the pews still standing in the need of prayer. But I want to tell both audiences, not only is God willing, but God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or think. And the truth is, some of us have more questions than we have answers right now. Some of us have more things on our minds than our mind's capacity to carry right now. But I want to tell you what God told me. Give that to me. Give them to me. Give it it is impossible for you to carry what only God can carry. It is impossible for you to do what only God can do. And God can do what no other can do. And so it is, God, that we look to you in prayer. God, with our hearts lifted and raised, some cases with tears in our eyes, recognizing your prevenient grace in this moment, recognizing that you have made yourself available for healing in this church. You have made yourself available to close gaps, to answer questions, to confirm your love, to redeem the loss, to help those who have problems on their minds. I thank you, Lord God, for cleaning us all up, <laughs> for doing a mighty work in our hearts. Forgive us of our trespasses. Forgive us of the things that have caused spiritual blood clots in our lives. Forgive us of the things, forgive us of the offenses that we have made towards each other. As we ask for forgiveness, God, we trust you that on the other side, there is a remake. We trust you that on the other side of this prayer, that this moment will not lo be lost in our minds. But I pray that this moment would serve as a turning point for this church as a turning point for some family, as a turning point for some child, for, as a turning point for all of us in the name of Jesus. We thank you in advance. We thank you in advance of what we've seen, in advance of what we've yet to see, in advance of your promises, in advance of your manifestations, in advance. We thank you in advance. <laughs> Loose those hands and lift them before God. We receive it. Whatever you want to do, whatever you want to say, however you want to move, in the name of Jesus, there is no other name we know to call on. Somebody say Jesus. Come on, somebody shout Jesus. Come on, somebody say Jesus. Look at somebody say, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you, my brother. I'm praying for you, my sister. You may return to your seats. Listen, I want to be a blessing. I want to be a blessing to this church. I'm done. But I dare not leave without being a blessing. How, do, how many of you know that college is hard to pay for? 
Amen, lights. Amen, church. And, and today, I, I want to challenge you as my wife and I sow a $500 seed into the scholarship fund of this church for some student that doesn't know where their tuition help is going to come from. I want to challenge you to get your best offering together. And who, who's the treasurer? Who, who's the treasurer? Who, who takes care of the finances? Because I, I want to know where people need to go. If they don't have cash, where do they need to go online to sow? Can they just go to the website? If you go to heritagereston.org, don't ask me how I know that website. Heritagereston.org. And if there, there's a giving portal, I want you to go to that portal. And I, I want you to sow into somebody else's life. And listen, I'm going to do what God told me to do. I'm going I'm to double what I'm giving today. Because there's a recession coming. And I don't know what your benevolence fund is. But this church needs to be prepared to support people who have nothing. Amen, church? So, so, so I want to challenge you not only to give to the scholarship fund, but I want to challenge you to give to the benevolence fund. Is, is there a specific name that they need to look for online? Talk to me. No? How will they know it's secure? And is there a label that they can say benevolence or they can indicate online? They can. Okay. So you can put benevolence. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Put it in the memo. Everybody say the memo section. <laughs> Mother has spoken. <laughs> so that nobody's confused. If you would, I want you to put something in the educational fund. I want you to put something in the benevolence fund. Is that all right? Is that all right, church? All right. There's nothing else. I'm going to invite you to come or whoever's coming. Come on, sis. All right, let's go ahead and give a thank you to Reverend Wilson. Amen, 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 amen. So before I go into my, my, my review of recap of what you said, you already started doing my next part of my job here of the how we're supposed to give, but I appreciate that. <laughs> I appreciate that. It's good. We wanted to just thank you and we thank God for putting this message on your heart and that we would remember to borrow in capacity so we are ready for what's to be filled, that we would shut the door and remember that God is there with us in our families, and that we will trust even when we don't see it. And I called, I put in my notes, I said it was biblical economic, microeconomics, right? That needs versus supply. I like God's version better than anything that we do in math class. I had a hard time in microeconomics, true story. So <laughs> I just wanted to thank you again. And now we're at the time of our end of our worship time, and so I have a couple of instructions. First thing we're going to do is we are going to pray over our offering, and the ushers will then direct you by row to bring your tithes and offering, and then return to your seat. Um, after that, uh, Reverend Wilkins will give the benediction, and after the benediction, we'll be able to exit, and we can briefly meet with Reverend Wilkins as we exit and proceed to the cafe for further instruction. Um, and number three, in addition to our giving time and this time of worship if you have any special prayer requests or you have anything that you need to speak with a deacon with um, you can meet them in the chapel for prayer so now that we've reached our time of giving we know that all belongs to God and we are blessed that he allows us to be stewards now we have a time to give back to him that of which he has blessed us please find the ways of giving on our website and no matter how you give, how much you give, or for those of you who are online from where that you give, 
We are grateful that you are choosing to take part in the building of this kingdom, this God's kingdom on earth. Ushers, I now invite you down for prayer time over the offer. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for giving us the opportunity to give back to you and the building of your kingdom. Lord, we bless those who have to give and those who do not. We come with open hearts and open minds and excited with anticipation of how you will designate these funds. Lord, each increase each cent and bless each heart that gives. We ask this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. You are now in, in the hands of the ushers.
pray that you all have a blessed week and a great remainder of your day. And please receive the benediction from Reverend Wilkins coming from the back. Church, say amen. amen. Now unto him <clears throat> who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. Let all of God's beautiful children say amen. amen. Say amen again. God bless you.